Consistently good doesn't get you fired, but it also doesn't win championships. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We are predicting everybody's record in the Power Five. Check out the videos from the Big 12, the Pac-12, the ACC, and the SEC. We're in the Big Ten. We're in the Western Division. We are looking at the main challenger, I believe, to the Wisconsin Badgers. That would be the Iowa Hawkeyes. Kirk Ferentz has been there forever, just about 20 years, going back to a team that was uh, high and dry at that point uh, under Hayden Fry and the end of his successful run. And uh, Ferentz took over the Hawkeyes and uh, really established them as a top 10 to 15 program early in his career. And that's where he really gained his reputation as a top-level coach and earned his paychecks and the contract that he's enjoyed since then. But if you take out the first couple years in which he took uh, the Hawkeyes to a Big Ten championship tie with the national champion Ohio State Buckeyes in 2002, a couple top 10 finishes, an Orange Bowl in 2009, a number of really good seasons. Basically, what it's become at Iowa is almost 7-5 and five or 8-4 and four every year. Basically, every year. Six of the last eight seasons with one high point. The team that went 12-0, and 0, then lost the Big Ten Championship in the Rose Bowl, and the low point at 4-8 in 2012. Other than that, always 7-5, 8-4. This may have a chance, this particular team, to do something special against a team in Wisconsin that we all believe is the best in the West. All right. Just to drive home this point, the S&P Plus measures overall success, uh, and how good you are based on your success from play to play against your competition the entire season. So over the last 10 years, Iowa is basically the 37th best team in the country, and that's about where you would expect them to be, the 37th best team in the country average over the past 10 years. Their projection for 2018 is to be the 36th best team in the country. Consistency good, but you aren't going to win championships. Nathan Stanley wants to win a championship, and I like this kid. I think he is a gunslinger, but still takes care of the football, and I really like Nathan Stanley. Completed 56% of his passes. That's because, again, he goes downfield for chunk plays. 26 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. So if he could get maybe the average up a little bit more, in checking down from time to time when it would be a little bit more of a discretionary act and then also take fewer sacks, Nathan Stanley will be one of the best quarterbacks in college football. He was successful enough to manage this offense and hit on enough big plays to result in the 23rd rated pass offense in the country based on the advanced metrics. All right, coming back for him are Two excellent tight ends, especially Noah Fant. 30 receptions, 11 touchdowns last year. Noah Fant could not be covered by Ohio State in that 55-24 throttling at Kinnick Stadium. He is a projected first-round draft pick. TJ Hawkinson, also a good change up at tight end as Iowa not only employs the tight end, but many times two of them. 24 catches, three touchdowns for Hawkinson. On the outside, these guys don't scare anyone, but they just produce. They just convert third downs. They just move the chains. That would be a Nick Easley with 51 catches and Matt, uh, Matt Vandenberg with 28. You got uh, Amir Smith-Marset who can get downfield a little bit more. 18 receptions and two touchdowns. All right. The running back situation really is puzzling here because aside from Saquon Barkley, Akram Wadley to me was just over the past couple of years, the most dangerous back in the Big Ten and one of the best in the country. A scat back who just made people miss was tough between the tackles as well. So not just a guy that had to make people miss, but he could lower the shoulder and be a tough back as well and caught the passes out of the backfield with silky smooth hands. All right, he's gone after gaining 1,100 yards and 11 touchdowns. And you had his backup who came in from Nevada, James Butler, who chipped in with like four or 500 yards. They're gone, both of them. So Iowa doesn't have experience back at running back, but they were only 103rd in rushing the football last year 
in the advanced metrics. Again, they ran it more than most teams run it, so the total yardage figures were good, better than 103rd in the nation. But if you take into account success rate down in distance, only number 103 out of 130 FBS teams in rushing success rate, even with those two guys, especially Wadley. So taking over for those two would be Torrin Young, who ran for 193 yards last year, and Ivory Kelly Martin for 184 yards. So inexperienced there, but they did uh, taste the field against Big Ten competition. Both tackles are back, and Nathan Stanley loves that, in uh, Alaric Jackson and Tristan Wirfs. They had 20 combined as starts last year. Let's get to the defense here. Surprisingly, the rush defense was marginal at best. You expect Iowa to be really, really capable uh, in the front seven. And they had linebackers that were tremendous. I talked about Wisconsin's linebacking core being possibly the best in college football in 2017. Iowa definitely at a top five to ten unit at linebacker. And the defensive line had studs against the pass, rushing the quarterback. But against the run, something was missing here because they were bad against the run, exceptional against the pass. Who did they lose? All the linebackers. And it just wasn't Josie Jewell. I could go through the linebackers, but they all contributed. Jewell was the stud with 132 total tackles. He was the All-American. Josh Jackson. He was a game changer, had three picks against Ohio State, had a couple pick sixes, a couple pick sixes against Wisconsin, which kept Iowa in the game, even though they were completely uh, outplayed in the first half. They're all gone to the NFL. All right, so the defensive front, Bose, Matt Nelson, and Cedric Lattimore at the tackles. They're decent players, but really the defensive ends are exceptional. And we saw it against Penn State. We saw it against Ohio State, just batting passes left and right. They're big, long, lengthy players with speed and agility. In uh, Parker Hesse, uh, Parker Hess, I should say, with a 10.5 tackles for loss. Anthony Nelson had uh, 9.5 tackles for loss and 7.5 sacks. A.J. Espinessa had 5.5 tackles for loss and 4 sacks. There are literally, as we broke camp in August uh, at the beginning of the month, nine linebackers in the mix. So I could just give you a bunch of names, but it doesn't matter until we see them on the field in week one against Northern Illinois, exactly who's going to play. Because we don't have a scouting report on any of these guys because they just didn't play. They played special teams. Two cornerbacks are back. Of course, Josh Jackson and his nation-leading eight picks gone Manny Rugamamba, he's back, and also Michael Ojamudia. Ojamudia and uh, Rugamba combined for 65 tackles. At safety, you got Jake Gervais. He had 58 stops, three picks, as well as uh, Amani Hooker, the junior, uh, now a junior at 56 tackles and two picks. Let's get to the Iowa schedule. All right. Um, It's not a good non-conference schedule. It's not extremely difficult, but it could be tricky. Northern Illinois in week one will be difficult, and Iowa has a penchant for losing to a MAC school or an FCS school or struggling against many of them. They typically don't drop the games, but if it's 21-16 mid-fourth quarter, don't be shocked. Iowa State, that was a battle last year in Ames. And uh, the Hawkeyes won it in overtime in a shootout, 44-41. And then we got to find out uh, later in the season very quickly how good the Cyclones are. Uh, Northern Iowa was the other game, so the Hawkeyes have to go 3-0 non-conference. Obviously, that doesn't play into the Big Ten schedule or uh, the pursuit of a Western Division championship. But in terms of uh, rankings and maybe a college football playoff appearance, those are crucial, of course. In the Big Ten Eastern Division, Iowa faces Indiana on the road in Maryland. The Hoosiers game in Bloomington, tricky. Remember this one. This this could be a Mark Rogers TV upset special at the time. We'll see. At Penn State, uh, win probability is low, winning in Happy Valley. All right, they do have a 10-win probability. The losses are supposed to be to Wisconsin and Penn State. They do have the Badgers at home. So for Iowa to win the Big Ten Western Division, you would think that they would need to defeat uh, Wisconsin at home. 
That's in week four or five. It's very early in the Big Ten schedule. And you can't imagine Wisconsin's going to automatically just go out and lose two other games, which would be what would have to happen if Iowa loses that game head-to-head. And they've got Wisconsin at home. They've got what you would expect to be the threats in the Big Ten Western Division at home. Northwestern, Nebraska, Wisconsin, all at home. So things are set up for Wisconsin. But the lack of some playmakers on the outside, aside from the tight end Noah Fant, who's one of the best in the business, the linebacking situation concerns me. And I just don't think, I I think Wisconsin's one of the 10 best teams in the country. And I was more like the 25th best team in the country. Nine and three, six and three in the Big Ten for the Hawkeyes. That's my thought. I do think that they could challenge. Again, winning at home against Wisconsin is going to be huge, huge, huge. Leave me your record on the Hawkeyes. Leave it down in the comments section. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter by simply sending your email address to MarkRogersTV at Gmail, where we will provide stats, trends, and information each and every Monday, along with my take on the college football weekend and a channel update as well. Right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football.